Hello and welcome back to Chit Heads. My name is Khalid and I'm one of the learning navigators at Embody Philosophy and I'm excited to open up today's episode which is with Daniel Simpson, previously recorded as part of Embodied Philosophy's Future of the Yoga Teacher Summit. Daniel Simpson is the author of The Truth of Yoga, an accessible guide to yoga history and philosophy. His approach combines scholarly knowledge with humor and insight, informed by more than 20 years of practical experience. He holds a master's degree in yoga studies from SOAS at the University of London and teaches courses at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies on yoga teacher trainings and via his website, truthofyoga.com. In a previous career, he was a foreign correspondent working with Reuters and the New York Times. In this episode, Daniel and Jacob discuss the relationship between intellectual knowledge and embodied experience, reconciling ourselves to a more accurate representation of yoga history, and what an ideal yoga teacher to yoga learner relationship looks like today. We hope you enjoy. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Jacob. Good to see you. Where are you at at the moment? Uh, ooh, not too far from you. Uh, northwest of Oxford in the middle of nowhere, in my yoga cave. I know. I was thinking actually before we started that it would have been nice if we had the technical setup to be able to, to host this kind of in a live interview format. Uh, that would be I nice. This will have to do. <laughs> it's pretty good as it goes. I mean, that's one of the wonders of tech. And um, you introduced me through Embodied Philosophy to Zoom. So when the pandemic came along, I already knew what I was doing. I felt like I'd, I'd, you know, I'd stolen a march. Was that, that was back in the the brief history of, of yoga course. Exactly, like, yeah, yeah, it must have been 20, 2018, I think it was right about the start of then. So yeah, I, I got oh. onto Zoom as a result of discovering embodied philosophy. Amazing. Well, we always love having you. Daniel teaches courses with us. He also contributes to the yoga philosophy uh, teacher training, and he is just um, a, a a great resource of knowledge and very excited to speak to you again today, Daniel, about something that we've actually talked a few times about. We had a, <laughs> a lovely conversation in a cafe in Oxford about this very topic, um, and we both are feel very passionately about it. So I'm really excited to talk about um, what we'll call, you know, the general theme of the relationship between intellectual knowledge and embodied experience within yoga and and what the balance the proper balance of these things should be and and perhaps some of the obstacles to kind of absorbing uh some of the the yoga intellectual landscape as it's emerged so my first question really is just maybe asking you to reflect on and share with us how you've seen yoga scholarship evolve and and kind of emerge over the last couple of decades um, and how that has impacted the space of of modern yoga? It's an excellent question. I mean, I think it really has been invented, to be entirely honest. Uh, There there wasn't really a tradition, certainly, of studying modern yoga until about 20 years ago. And uh, as a practitioner, um, I grew up with modern yoga studies. So as I started having more and more questions about how what we do today under the the rubric of yoga relates to what other people have called yoga in centuries gone by, I had increasingly, you know, rich resources to turn to. Um, But at first I turned to a place where I got more and more bamboozled, which was traditional yoga texts. (laughs) You know, uh, like many yoga students, I opened the Yoga Sutra and having been told by my teacher, I would find more meaning about what we were doing in class and uh, said, where are all the poses? Um, and uh, you know, it took a while to to start getting some clarity on that question, and it really began, I suppose, you know, in a m- mainstream way with Mark Singleton's book Yoga Body in 2010, that polarised the yoga community for all sorts of reasons, but uh, did draw widespread attention to the fact that yoga has changed, and what we know of as a modern tradition of practising yoga through the sequences of postures that are the primary means of instruction these days is a relatively recent phenomenon and there are no ancient yoga texts that talk about it so you know that's that's jarring to discover but it's also quite liberating because it opens our minds to this whole question of yoga being 
you know, a tradition in flux. It's not fixed. It's not something that's absolutely timeless, that has never changed, that we can, you know, always tune into in exactly the same way as everybody else has always tuned into it. And um, I hold out the prospect that there might be something that one accesses through the practice of yoga that is of that nature. Um, right. But the methodologies, the contexts, the reasons, the people involved, they've all changed and they've changed enormously in the last hundred years. And this uh, field of you know modern yoga studies in the last 20 years has mushroomed to the point that you know, nobody can really keep up with it you know, individually. I remember back 10, 12 years ago, it was possible to read everything that was being produced on the subject, and, uh, you know, to know the handful of people who were producing those articles. Whereas now people have been inspired by that, like me, and gone to do master's programs or PhDs and started producing books and uh, research projects of their own. And, uh, you know, there, there are now hundreds of people active in this field. And uh, it's so rich that uh, it can be quite confusing. And uh, I think that's the other side of it, really. You know, it has revealed to us some some really fascinating and you know, essential uh, truths about the changing face of yoga. Um, but it's also created lots of uh, cul-de-sacs, labyrinths, um, yeah, uh, dead ends that we can easily lose ourselves in. Because in the end, this is you know, an academic intellectual exercise of analysis, of you know, contextualizing um, yoga practice. It's not a means of instruction in yoga. And uh, we can easily get the two things confused, I think, particularly because a lot of the people producing the research are yoga practitioners. And would love to suggest that the two fields are basically the same. Um, and I don't think they are. <laughs> I think they're they're speaking slightly different languages, but can be very richly combined. It's just we need to be able to discern the difference between them sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, this is so interesting. And it 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 it's making me think of how, you know, with in prior to kind of the emergence, let's call it the reconciling ourselves to kind of uh, a more accurate representation of yoga history. One thing that yoga practitioners, many of them felt, was a sort of connection, an emotional, affective sort of relationship with the tradition. And, mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways, what has kind of occurred for many yoga yoga teachers, and part of it had to do with kind of the reception of yoga body, rightly or wrongly, um, but that emotional connection has been kind of lost in this ocean of of really kind of pedantic textual scholarship, for lack of a <laughs> to use a slightly judgmental term. So, so you know, some might say, well, that's the responsible thing. That emotional connection was sort of an illusion, and what's actually true is that what we're doing now has no, you know. I don't know, a long-standing historical connection to the tradition. And so there was something right about that, that emotional, you know, break. So I'm wondering, you know, how you feel about that. And if, mm -hmm. if there is a space for a renewal or a regeneration of that emotional connection with yoga tradition, while also honoring uh, the reality of of the the historical shift in understanding. Excellent question, and I really like the way that you use the word "feel" in there because it is it is a very um, you know intuitive uh, felt experience how we relate to this information. And for a lot of people, I think the words that really comes to my mind, at least thinking back to that time, the the, you know, the the impact of this sort of analysis was was to disenchant people. It was you know, like having the rug pulled out from underneath your precious altar and have the whole thing grind to dust. <laughs> and uh, um, you know, in some ways, that's part of growing up to be able to 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 be told that Santa Claus isn't real and uh, to not burst into tears and throw a temper tantrum. But uh, you know, at the same time, that doesn't mean that there isn't anything magical in the yoga world. And it's very easy, again, to get these two things jumbled up. Um, and there are some in the academic yoga world who would suggest that it's actually impossible to define yoga because there are so many different conflicting you know, expressions of yoga in different traditions over the centuries that uh, to 
you know, identify one of them above the others or to try and generalize in any meaningful way about them would be to negate all of that diversity. Um, you know, on the one hand, that's very empowering. There's all sorts of traditions, but in the end, it means nowhere is there actually anything that we can identify as yoga. There's just competing discourses. And this is very yeah. much, you know, the, the language of, of uh, academia of the last few decades. And, you know, that's not what yoga is about. <laughs> yoga is about going beyond language. Um, so I think part of the process of, of, of re-enchantment um, is to realize that this, this information helps us to contextualize what we do, to be better informed about, you know, whether or not some of the stories people tell about yoga history stand up to scrutiny. But it absolutely shouldn't turn us off from practicing. In fact, it should help us to find our own direct connection with something that comes out of the yoga tradition because if we haven't got one of those why are we calling what we do yoga rather than you know whatever else it might be um stretching to roomy poems is one of my favorite definitions at the moment i, I think a lot of yoga classes could you know easily be rebranded under all sorts of other headings and and what keeps them connected to yoga tradition is to have some degree of continuity despite all of this change the two things aren't mutually exclusive in fact, you know, a lot of teachers who've been very innovative over particularly the last uh, you know, century and a half or so um, have gone to great lengths to make sure that all of the things that they did that were innovative were somehow aligned with previous traditions. They did that a little bit too creatively, though. They covered their tracks and tried to pretend they hadn't changed anything and it all came from the Vedas. But um, they were at the same time, you know, very concerned to ensure that there was some continuity. And I think in the modern yoga world, it's very easy to get so confused um, that we imagine that there is no connection. We don't know how to get one. We therefore feel a bit inauthentic, imposters perhaps, um, concerned about you know being accused of culturally appropriating. And I think the best defense against all of this is to engage in some study uh, and to, to, through an understanding of what's been there at different stages of yoga history, find stuff that speaks to us and be able to you know, anchor ourselves firmly in that and be able to speak from, you know, therefore two very clear perspectives i'm here right now and this is what yoga means to me and i align myself to a certain extent with some of what i find over here which is what yoga was at this moment um, and as long as we could as long as we can do that i think we can talk about having an authentic relationship on our own terms with yoga here and now and also with yoga tradition in a way that is respectful and the most respectful thing about it is to acknowledge the distinction between here and now and there and then, rather than pretending that we are somehow perfectly embodying what Patanjali had to say 1600 years ago. Mm. So, you know, this idea of authenticity is is one of the questions that I that I had for you. And, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about it as a kind of, I guess, compare contrast, um, because I think where this word comes out of right and the sensitivity around it is that um, mm -hmm. the idea of an authentic yoga tradition is often sort of the, you know, the battle cry of sort of certain um, defenders of of yoga and rightly so, right, because they're trying to say, hey, look, there is something more essential, there's something more esoteric, there's something wiser about the, the yoga tradition and in this kind of shallow iteration of it and in, in, in physical, purely physical postures, um, you know, something is lost. And so, and so that's kind of the spirit of this claim of an authentic yoga, but, but we slip into some issues, right, based on what you're saying about who decides what is and isn't authentic. So how do we understand the difference between authenticity in this kind of more problematic way versus authenticity um, in the way that you're, you're kind of offering it as an option? Well, I guess in some ways it's back to the original question. It's sort of almost, you know, the, 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 the learning from recent yoga scholarship um, because uh, you know, academics have lots of words that they like to bandy around. And one that sort of seems to be quite en vogue in various forms is to problematize things and everything gets problematic <laughs> and uh, you know, this whole idea of there being an essence to anything is essentially problematic there is no essence to yoga in this way um, and uh, the two schools of thought that like to talk about there being an essence to yoga are in some way often 
uh, culturally nationalist and um, saying yoga comes from India, it has to be you know, expressed in these particular ways, otherwise it's disrespectful. Or they are culturally universalist and they're saying, well, anybody can access this yogic state wherever they might be. It doesn't belong to anybody. And those two voices will always talk past each other. And then just to complicate everything further, along come the scholars and say, there's no essence anywhere. <laughs> and you're just left with lots of people talking past each other. Um, so I think it is helpful to tune into all of that and to acknowledge that um, this misunderstanding and even you know, the nature of the conversations around it can cause harm. And uh, there are things that we need to learn about, you know, the, the problem inherent in trying to you know, become particularly authentic in any way, shape or form, because there is no one true yoga from which everything descends. There have been many different traditions that uh, have often been in conflict with each other, that have you know, directly tried to contradict each other's teachings, that have tried to, you know, uh, in some ways, borrow from each other you know, by stealth and remix things and uh, you know, effectively steal and therefore appropriate. Um, that's part of the history of yoga. It's, it's a long-standing, ongoing process. Um, so what's happening now isn't new, and it's good to be aware of that. But if we're not going to continue that and you know, contribute negatively to it, I think we need to get clearer about the distinction between our priorities, what we're doing, um, and what yoga means today, and what yoga has been in the past, and the impossibility, therefore, of authenticity actually meaning aligning ourselves 100% you know, perfectly with any tradition, even if we're part of a living lineage, it will be in a state of constant reinvention. That's the nature of tradition. Inherent even in the word tradition is this vague idea of betrayal. It comes from a Latin verb, which means to hand over, and it can therefore be handing somebody over for punishment. Um, yeah, basically, again, pulling the rug out from under them. The whole idea of tradition is the handing over across generations of something that's a bit like uh, what we would call in the UK Chinese whispers, or in the US, I think you call telephone, where you start a little circular repetition of a phrase and it gets distorted over time. Um, and that's not because anybody's corrupt, it's because contexts change. Things need to be presented differently. Um, and at any stage in the process of evolution, People are having to engage with the reality of where they are, what priorities are, um, what social circumstances are, who's practicing and why, um, who is the sponsor of the whole yoga teaching project, um, and how to marry all of these you know, forces. This is nothing to do with <laughs> deep spiritual truth. It's worldly reality of being alive. Um, and we live in a context. And the clearer we are about our context, the more honest we can be about how that differs. And then you know, be aware of the fact that we need to be respectful about our engagement with something that isn't from our time and place. But at the same time, accepting, I think, that it is possible for us to have some degree of sincerity, clarity um, and meaning in our relationship with something that isn't from our time and space. Otherwise, why would any of us have got interested in yoga in the first place? Um, I grew up in the United Kingdom, yeah, I'm white Northern European. I I'm not Indian from 2000 years ago. And yet I've been really turned on by the idea of yoga, by the practice of yoga, by the states one can access through yoga practice. And in more recent times, the discussion of the history and philosophy of yoga in a more scholarly way. And all of those things, I think, can coexist, and I can have an authentic relationship with all of it, <laughs> including the fact that I can never be an authentic yogi from the time of Patanjali. Uh, and mm -hmm. yeah, so I think we have to really reframe what we mean by this word, and we have to own it for ourselves. We have to actually take responsibility to stand up and say, here is how I am inspired by yoga tradition, um, here is what I teach based on my understanding from what I have learned from my teachers, rather than trying this you know, endless game of pretending, trying to assert right here, right now in the 21st century that we are part of some unbroken expression of something that doesn't change. And the, you know, the sooner we can all, you know, I guess, square up to that and perhaps even start producing our own 21st century yoga texts, <laughs> the more honest we'll get about the fact that things have changed. And it's okay for things to change. And I think the last thing I'd like to say is things do not have to be ancient to be authentic. 
But then we need to have criteria for what makes them authentic. So we have to know why we call something yoga, why we might think that some things don't deserve the term yoga, um, and therefore what the key ingredients are for us. We might not be able to essentialize yoga for everybody, but if we can't give a working definition to ourselves, and if we're teaching to our students of what yoga means and why, then we're in a bit of a mess, I think. Mm. So interesting, such interesting uh, perspectives, Daniel. Um, I love listening to you speak about these things. So I'm going to ask a question that's a, um, inspired a little bit by anonymous attendee. <laughs> uh, she's asked the question in the Q and A, um, and it's I it's the question is what do you think is the one thing that connects the roots of yoga and mm -hmm. modern yoga? Um, but I'm going to maybe ask it in a slightly different way, um, which is. I guess, you know, we're talking about kind of the way in which tradition is variable and, and things have shifted and there might be something which, you know, transcends yoga, call it essence for lack of a better term. Of course, the tradition has many, many words for it um, that some would argue that's the foundation, right? The Purusha or the Atman or the, the absolute, however you want to conceive it. But for you, what is the locus of your sense of connection to yoga's history? Um, mm -hmm. uh, because if it is, uh, you know, a diversely variable thing that, and, uh, you know, there's been junctures throughout history, then where do we, do we need to have a locus? Like, do we, do we need to have fa a foundation for that sense of connection with the tradition? How do you, how do you think about that? Really good question. A really difficult one to answer. Um, I think the first thing I'd really like to underline is the importance of faith. And, um, you know, we can turn to many yoga texts and see the Sanskrit word shraddha, which uh, means faith, um, literally belief in on one level, um, but, but, but also um, commitment to the yoga practice. It's through faith in the practice that we actually get on with practice in the first place. Um, so I think, you know, somehow we have to have a connection to the past in order to, to, to really, you know, be clear that there's something that we're aiming to, to, to do in our yoga practice, even if all we're aiming to do is to remove the obstacles to just being present. Uh, that might be one very modern way of expressing things that you know often is assumed to be what Patanjali was getting at in his very first word, utta, uh, but it's not quite what he was, <laughs> what he was driving at there. Um, I think the consistent theme we can draw from all old expressions of what yoga is, regardless of what yoga has become in the meantime, is that we're supposed to turn inwards. And um, that is yeah, almost without exception part of the process of yoga practice, even if the result of that is to be better equipped for turning outwards and being part of the world. Not often discussed in yoga texts, but one of the best known, the Bhagavad Gita, is all about that, using the inwardliness to cultivate the capacity to be externally effective. Um, and as we live in the 21st century, that's probably what we're looking to do <laughs> from mm. tuning in to be able to then re-engage uh, more skillfully and uh, if we're going to think about what that entails I think we need to be also very tuned into um, the very concept of inquiry that we're, we're looking within for a purpose it's not just some directionless navel gazing um, we're actually trying to you know, achieve something um, although there's often, you know, the suggestion, nothing to do, nowhere to go, just wake up to the reality of who we are. Um, but there is some directionality to that process. And without some sort of anchor, again, this idea of the faith that there's somewhere to get, um, we can't really make much progress. Um, and the final aspect of that, I think, is discernment, the ability to tell the difference between things. It's all very popular these days to say no judgment you know yoga is about not judging but that's not true at all if you look at the mm -hmm. old yoga texts they all talk about the absolute essential um, importance of judging to be able to distinguish what's conducive to benefit and what is not and to be able to make that separation when actually has to have some orientation in a direction and the popularity of non-dual philosophy, the idea that all is one, yoga means union, often blinds us to the ability to make these sorts of distinctions um, and, and to be able to assess things, to tell the difference between one thing and another, that which is just you know, temporarily gratifying, as the Kata Upanishad would put it, and that which is lastingly of benefit. 
Um, or as the Buddha would say, you know, that which is skillful and beneficial. Um, the Bhagavad Gita probably got its skill in action definition from that same you know, ancient renouncer concept. We have to sift things for ourselves. So I would say all of that turns to me into one important condition. It's concentration, but with an orientation. And how we define that will depend on what speaks to us, which tr traditions, which texts, which practices. Um, for example, one might get very good at focusing the mind in order to be able to visualize things. It's not to still the mind, to empty it. It's to make it full with all sorts of pretty pictures or to recite <laughs> mantras. Um, so there's many ways you can use this skill of concentration. But I think concentration is really a non-negotiable, you know, foundation for all of those things i've just been describing and that is what can connect modern postural yoga back to ancient tradition edwin bryant in his book on the yoga sutras makes a really good point about uh, the yoga sutra 139 the 39th sutra of the samadhi pada saying um you can basically meditate on anything you like so long as your mind gets one pointed so if you pay attention to a blizzard of alignment instructions and that will steady your mind, then you've got some possibility to go further. Without this ability to concentrate, we're just thrown around. The mind is blown one place to another, as Arjuna complained in the Bhagavad Gita. So I think, you know, the, the clearer we can be about the fact that the, the whole point is mental training and that we need to turn inwards to do that and we need some kind of map to guide us on our journey will be clear that we need to turn to yoga texts. We might not get all our answers from yoga texts. They're certainly not going to tell us how to live in the 21st century, but we'll start to be able to compile our own little bullet point list of a few principles that we think are important. And we can find our own way of embodying them, our own way of adapting whatever it is we do today um, to those core principles. And I think that's a way of having an authentic connection with them, even if we've slightly changed them, because we'll inevitably change them because we're not world renouncers if we're turning to a text like the Yoga Sutra, which is what it was trying to speak to, the possibility of leaving the world behind. Hmm. Wow. You said so many, you know, interesting things, so many directions we could go down. But one of the things that I just really appreciated that I want to remark on is the the importance of of faith and commitment, because I feel like this element is not really talked about very much. And, and maybe, you know, maybe to our detriment, right? Because, of course, you can't talk about faith and sort of academic uh, <laughs> uh, status quo <laughs> intellectual conversations. And, and, you know, if we extract faith from its sort of Judeo-Christian sense, maybe, maybe even fidelity, but, but mm. rather that there is this sort of intangible emotional connection that we have to continuously articulate and, and um, are continuously cultivate, I should say, and, and bring to bear in our mm. relationship with, with the yoga tradition and, and no kind of sort of rational form of argumentation or justification is going to be able to capture that right because it's no. something deeply personal and and so i'm so, i'm just so glad that you that you spoke to that oh thanks i'm glad it strikes a chord um i you know <laughs> I, it's not it's not a word i was comfortable using till recently because of my own sort of rejection of my judeo christian upbringing perhaps but um i love the connection there you made between faith and fidelity which brings us back to authenticity so yeah you know, being able to truly believe in what we're doing is very important and um you know that's that's where scholarship and philosophy completely diverge um Academic analysis of things, um, you know, it does have a lot it can offer us. Um, you know, it can tell us about the history of you know, texts and contexts, so, which is you know, very enriching. We can read a lot more yoga texts than we were able to. I should have emphasized this earlier as well as the result of increasing focus on translating ancient Indian texts, not even only in Sanskrit now, also in other um, Indic languages. Um, we've got a much richer understanding of the variety of practices and the, you know, um, sectarian context in which they existed so the different faith traditions in a way the different framing for you know the the se se same sort of practices uh, spanning all religions really and uh, also you know no religion um so there's there's all these options out there um but if we actually want guidance on on you know what practices <laughs> what it means and why we're doing it that's the field of philosophy and um you know, really, I think philosophy isn't even the right word when it comes to yoga. It's it, it's a discipline of knowledge. And that knowledge has to be realized. It has to be embodied as, as in the title of the organization. Um, it's not abstractions. It's not thinking. In fact, the whole essence of yoga philosophy is to go beyond thinking. Um, so if you 
distill it into a very simple maxim, Patanjali's entire text could be reduced to sit down and shut up. Um, and that's that. <laughs> but obviously then, you know, we need to know what we're doing. Otherwise, we're just going to sit there and think, well, have I, have I shut up for long enough yet? Why, you know, we, we need some intellectual input, but we're not going to get the right kind of intellectual input to inform how we practice from yoga scholarship. And I think mm -hmm. this is one of my bugbears of recent times is the um, the suggestion that by yeah, studying the output of academics, we're going to get better integrated with what we do as practitioners. I mean, it's just very misleading. I think um, some people are drawn to learn more about history and uh, about, you know, about context and about, um, I guess, uh, important contemporary issues that arise in yoga practice, as you were discussing in the uh, in the opening session. Um, and that's all well and good, but that's not necessarily going to guide what we do as practitioners. Um, for that, we need teachers. <laughs> we need commitment to the practice and we need some sort of you know orientation coming out of the tradition to to ensure that we're going somewhere that's been vaguely tried and tested rather than completely freestyling and about to drive off a cliff yes that that's such an important point and it's it touches on um on something i wanted to talk to you about that you're already a little bit speaking to which is the gap between, let's just call it for the time being yoga philosophy, um, but maybe we could play with the word philosophy, um, and yoga scholarship, which you're already talking about how, you know, there's a gap between um, the scholarship and my and whatever it is, the motivating element that, uh, you know, both connects me to my practices that, and then nourishes and enriches it um, and causes some form of insight to arise. It seems like and tell me if you think differently, that there's a, a missing kind of um, dimension of, let's say, knowledge, you know, writings on knowledge, or I, I don't know, theorizing or philosophizing, that would actually fill this space where we are engaging intellectually with the tradition, we are discerning and, and um, and developing, you know, refinement of knowledge as you've been talking about, but at the same time, it is also nourishing and inspiring our practice. And and so I, I guess I'm I'm wondering how you see that distinction. Like, what is the what 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 do we call that? And also, what does the future look like for creating more discourse, more knowledge like that? Really good questions. I mean, I think it that is yoga philosophy. It's contemporary yoga philosophy. It involves us doing the philosophizing and having our own ideas. And to come back to a theme I was sort of harping on about earlier, having the confidence to stand up and say, these are my ideas, instead of trying to disguise our ideas in some ancient sage's name while completely distorting what that sage said. And, uh, you know, I think I think that's something that people are still scared of doing. And it's happened already in other fields. You know, we can learn, I think, from, uh, for example, the secularization of mindfulness. Um, and we can learn some of the pitfalls from that as well um, and uh, you know, see <laughs> some ways how not to do it, as well as how to uh, you know, make um, some basic principles so universally accessible that they become just part of the cultural landscape and, and you know, no longer seem alien. Um, and the only aspect of the yoga tradition that's really achieved that so far is making shapes. You can now do that in every gym. Um, but the, the philosophical components and the foundations of, you know, what reduces suffering and perhaps, you know, enables us to function more effectively in relation to each other, um, that's not been emphasized in the same way. And the only way that's going to happen is by talking about the realities of being alive today, uh, rather than just expecting that somehow by osmosis, stuff that was said 2000 years ago, or you know, perhaps slightly more recently is, is somehow going to address what we want to do with the ideas. It isn't, unfortunately. So we're going to have to bridge that gap for ourselves. And academics aren't going to do that for the most part, because this is what they would really class as theology. <laughs> it's basically yeah. the production of religious uh, material, rather than the analysis of material produced by other people. Um, and, you know, that's, 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 I never went further with academic study. I just realized I was going to run up against that. And uh, 
was going to have to constantly reframe everything through you know various layers of theory <laughs> in order to be able to get away with saying anything and that just seemed like a waste of time um but uh yeah i'm really glad scholars are there doing what they do but that can't in itself fill that gap unless they were to turn their attention to you know, contemporary philosophizing that's more likely to come out of a philosophy department than it is out of a yoga studies department but it's probably not going to come out of a Western philosophy department either, um, for the reasons that you could probably articulate very clearly, having spent time in one yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So I think yeah, the sort of uh, combination of scholarship and practice that uh, yeah, is the focus of, of, of embodied philosophy is, is the seeding ground for those sorts of developments. Uh, it's not the only place where that can happen, but uh, yeah, it's, I guess, showcasing the importance of talking. And yeah, this is something that's always bothered me. Um, it bothered me right when I was starting out as a yoga practitioner. There's no space in the yoga studio to get together and chat. Um, there's the shoes. You can put your shoes on. You have a few you know, words with each other and off you go. Maybe there's some gathering once a month um, or perhaps there's occasionally some kirtan or somebody gives a satsang as a visiting teacher. But there isn't on the timetable in the same way that there are 30 plus asana classes or whatever it might be, uh, you know, a, a bunch of opportunities to come together and talk uh, and to exchange ideas and to actually engage in asking and answering questions. And, and really, the answers to these questions, when they're going to be the most fruitful, are going to come from ourselves or, or the voice within us that is wiser than the one between the ears. Um, and that's something that can only really be nurtured by exposure to others who are thinking and speaking in that way, um, because otherwise we're stumbling around blindly with an you know, undeveloped capacity to speak in that way. Um, and so it's almost like, you know, academic seminars, <laughs> but not for the purpose of academic knowledge, for the purpose of coming together to talk about experience. So you know, in a way, what you're doing now with these, these gatherings, that's, that's part of the embodied philosophy offering. That's a step in that direction, which most yoga studios could do with learning from. But of course, the reality of the yoga studio space is, you know, time is money. And uh, unless you get bodies in rooms, you're not maximizing the potential, the bills don't get paid and the studio shuts. So you know, I've run up against this myself. I, I used to run a yoga book club in what was basically a glorified broom cupboard that doubled as a, a meditation space. And there were so few people who actually wanted to bother to go and sit and meditate that I was allowed to put 10 people in there and talk about yoga texts. But that was about all we could get in a studio that had five you know, <laughs> big spaces in which people would gather to, to make shapes on mats. Mm. Yeah, I love I love the idea of a yoga book club. And I hear your point. And I think it's an important one about, you know, the need for these kinds of conversational spaces. It did make me think that like even with what in the context of in yoga studios, when yoga philosophy is taught, it is often taught in this kind of like lecture sort of style format where, you know, and I mean, of course, we do plenty of that ourselves. Um and and so there isn't as much time for conversation. And I think I, you know, I wonder if part of that um has to do with the uh, because the, the the complexity, right, of, of yoga philosophy and, and the nuances of it does lead some people to feel like they're not actually yet equipped to to actually speak, you know, articulately about these things. And and therefore there's a little sensitivity around around, you know getting from here to there, basically getting from this place of, you know, this is completely new to me to this place where I can have, you know, a fruitful conversation about, about it with other people. And, and, and so I think a lot of us are like not comfortable stumbling through that, that not knowingness. So I guess, you know, what, what's the option there? Um, what's sort of, what is a, the type of space that could kind of honor that, you know, the variability of people's access and understanding of, of yoga philosophy while still kind of allowing for an engagement in this way? Great question. And uh, I think there's two things that sort of come to mind uh, before, I, before I give a direct answer. One is that, you know, I mean, everybody's entitled to an opinion, whether, whether they're, they're steeped in wisdom or not, but it doesn't also mean that every opinion is equally valid and uh, you know, is well supported by, you know, um, wisdom, let's say. Uh, but it's great to have the freedom to speak. It's like if you're trying to learn a foreign language, you're never going to speak it perfectly until you speak it badly a lot. <laughs> and yeah. it's going to be the same with philosophizing. So being comfortable with, you know, saying stuff that might sound dumb and that you might regret or wish you could have unsaid, that's part of the process of, of, of finding, you know, uh, inspiration 
Um, it's like being a writer, you know, I've written books and they involve writing a lot of words that you end up deleting. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. you're very glad that the outside world never got to read. Uh, and that's that's just this how it is. Um, so having a space where you can do that comfortably, you come together as a group, everybody agrees, as we you know we did at the start of this session, to respect the space and to respect each other and to allow us to to really you know, fall flat on our faces with it being totally fine. Nobody's nobody's shamed for that. That's just how it is. <laughs> but you know, hopefully wisdom starts to arise. And then to come to the answer to the question. You've been facilitating that. The uh, the certificate programs um, contain within them integration sessions. Um, so anybody who's not had an opportunity to experience that, just to summarize it very simply, is part of an extended program of study. Um, there is an opportunity to come together live um, and seeded by you know, a quick presentation from somebody like me uh, to then spend time together in small groups discussing a topic that you've you know, thought about in advance for 20, 25 minutes, coming back together into a larger group to share ideas and then going back into a smaller group again to discuss it. And amazing things come out of that process because it's fed by people's sincere engagement with the material it's not their, their attempt to parrot the knowledge or to pass the exam or to look like a good student it's often to ask really awkward questions or to say things that you know throw everything totally upside down and require further consideration and and that's how we learn that's 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 when it becomes something that we're really engaged with it's like getting out and playing in the mud and not worrying about the fact that we're getting dirty that's the whole point mm, such a good answer yeah um uh, I like that you brought up the example of of the learning a language because I actually think that's a really, as an adult, you know, I I I started studying Sanskrit much later in in life, really, uh, you know, analogously to my previous education, and um, and I really have had to really humble myself in the face of feeling like such an idiot uh, so many times, but like that's such a necessary part of the process, and I feel like as we as we get older, sometimes we close down that that um, that comfort with being uncomfortable. Going back to something we spoke about earlier, and and it really is a great lesson to just be reminded that it's okay, like you said, to fall flat on your face. It's okay to stumble through something, and as long as you you know you know that you're in a compassionate space where people are you know guided by an intention to lift other people up and to support each other. I think that's that's where those fears can hopefully start to dissolve. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Oh, thanks. No, it's a really, really fun conversation we're having. I'm wondering, are there any questions that we, we, we yeah. should address from the others? Exactly. That's what I'm turning to now before we run out of uh, time here. So uh, if you do have questions, please, please, please. We have about a little less than 10 minutes. I would love to ask your questions so many directions um, that we've uh, gone down and so many nuggets of wisdom that Daniel shared. We do have one question here from Florence in the Q&A uh, that is asking, what do you think about the merging of traditions? For example, a quote, Christian yoga. Really good question. Um, I, I discussed this actually uh, very recently. I, I've just started a podcast, you know, probably you know, 10 years too late to get any listeners, but hey, you know, <laughs> I've, I've always been a bit Never late to late. fashion. <laughs> and uh, I was chatting to a teacher, an uh, American guy, uh, Frank Jude Bocho, last week, um, who uh, wrote a book about 10 years ago called Mindfulness Yoga, um, which is a very deliberate merging of the Buddha's um, discourse on the foundations of mindfulness, Satipatthana Sutta, um, with contemporary you know asana practice um, and he i think made the point really well um that uh in fact that is perhaps the most authentic ancient source we can turn to for guidance on what we were talking about earlier paying attention concentrating on the positions of the body in space that actually describes that it's basically you know manual for everything from mindful washing up to um contemplating the decay of the body as it you know eventually falls back into ashes to ashes dust to dust um, mm -hmm. But he was saying, obviously, you know, you don't necessarily talk about death in the yoga class, but you've got in that text a framework for working with felt experience that is authentic and traditional. It's not, you know, geared towards modern postural yoga but it lends itself so much better than for example what's in the yoga sutra which is really a manual for sitting down to meditate you know for a very long time um, and of course there are nuggets of wisdom in it that we can apply to other things including us in the practice um, 
but uh, it's perhaps a less le less skillful fit. So I think you know there are very many ways in which hybrids uh, can be made, and I think Christian yoga is another you know, fascinating prospect. Um, there have been many different religious traditions combined with yoga teachings. I mean, in ancient India, Jainism, Buddhism, um, what we now know as Hinduism, all very closely aligned with these ideas. But um, as a result of colonial involvement with India and uh, you know, initially um, from uh, the Islamic world, there was Sufi yoga. So, you know, the, the Rumi quote stretching that I was slightly, you know, <laughs> I suppose mocking in a way earlier has got a lot more historical basis than some of the other you know, mixing and matching that goes on in the modern yoga world. Similarly, with Chinese traditions, you might say yin yoga is a modern hybrid. It's not, you know, anciently authentic. Um, it was dreamed up in in the last you know, 25 years um well i mean comes from originally taoist yoga which does come from original instructions on moving with the body and um, that go back 2000 years but um, the packaging of what we now know as yin yoga is a relatively recent thing but again it's got this ancient you know heritage there's interaction between india and china um going back you know many many centuries and may even have had some role in influencing the development of indian physical practices so um there's just this long history of cultural exchange that i think makes it possible to intelligently synthesize yoga with almost any context um but I think that has to be done carefully. And I think especially in this day and age with respect for the tradition, i.e. the yoga one, that you are perhaps sort of moulding into a new shape in uh, in its combination with, some, with somewhere else's way of seeing. And sometimes in the Western world, the idea of Christian yoga is because... Yeah, Indian Hatha yoga is somehow the devil's work. It's raising the serpent in the form of Kundalini. Um, it's going to convert you to a heathen religion, um, therefore must be, you know, made to go away. And instead, if we just sort of borrow the shapes and give them new names and worship, you know, the, the wonderful bounty of Jesus, then everything will be fine. And I think that could be argued to be somewhat disrespectful. Um, but again, you know, the idea of concentrating on what goes on in the body is not necessarily indigenous to yoga teachings anyway, but perhaps it just shouldn't be called yoga. It should just be you know, Christian calisthenics with mindful engagement or something of that sort <laughs> might be, hmm. might be a more, more honest term. Yeah. So I have another question here from, we have about five minutes left. Um, so if you have a question, please do uh, drop it in the Q and A now, and I will, I'll try to get to it before we um, run out of our uh, time together. Uh, this is from our, our friend, anonymous attendee again. Um, how do we practice concentration in the hyper digital age with never ending emails and IG images as a yoga entrepreneur or otherwise? Another very good question. I mean, the simple answer is throw away the smartphone, obviously, but that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done that. And um, I don't expect that many people will feel moved to do it. But there has to be some uh, discipline involved. Yoga is, if nothing else, as one of my teachers used to bark, <laughs> a discipline. Um, and uh, that, that means the ability to draw boundaries. In fact, uh, you know, the whole concept of yama and niyama is you know, rooted in this uh, verbal root yum, <laughs> just to restrain. So it, it is definitely to draw the line, to decide, you know, where to mindfully engage. Yoga is about choosing where to place our attention and to do that with clear intent. Um, so uh, it's hard uh, and uh, it will always end up being you know, a challenge, especially if you're trying to run a yoga business, which depends on being active on social media channels and responding to what other people are doing in order to maintain that presence. So you know, I've come to the realization if I'm going to get another book written, I'm going to have to restrict even my access to email, um, perhaps to beginning and end of the day, rather than what I like to do, which is to be on it all the time, because it you know, gives me something to feel I'm productive with when I'm struggling to write the next sentence. Um, otherwise, I'll just get lost in all of the things that I could be doing other than what I need to be doing. So the clearer we are about what we need to be doing, the easier I think it becomes to say, well, this stuff has to just take a back seat for X amount of time so that 
that gets done. Um, if we're just sort of unsure where to focus, it's much harder to concentrate. But once we've got priorities, which comes back to that original question of what am I doing and why, um, I think perhaps it gets a little bit easier, but it's, it's, it's hard. We're getting our brains rewired by this technology. And uh, you know, I, I, I don't hold out much hope for us avoiding being turned into cyborgs if we're not careful. So there will be the eventual yoga distinction will have to be between do we play that game or do we finally resist and carry on being you know, uh, imperfect humans. Mm. So there's a really good question that just came in. I want to, I do want to ask mm. it before we run out of time, but I just want to make sure that before I, I, um, before we end that I get an opportunity to mention again, um, that Daniel has written a book that, uh, is wonderful and is, should be a part of every reading list and yoga teacher trainings. There it is. The truth of yoga, a very humble name, very tough. <laughs> It does say um, on the first page that there is no one truth of yoga, and that's the essential <laughs> truth. But yeah. Uh, so this question is oh, there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, hopefully, uh, well, we'll we'll collate them if we run mm. out of time. But this question is: What does the ideal yoga teacher to yoga learner relationship look like today? This is interesting. So very different from traditional guru disciple relationship, I imagine. But how to maintain the special aspects of that relationship today? Really good question. I think there's a lot to be said for one-to-one -one teaching, and um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't make sense financially a lot of the time. That's why yoga studios sprung up. Um, it's very hard to get you know that number of people to pay you to, to spend time. There's not enough hours in the week. Um, but uh, that's when you know real directed, focused, um, clear engagement on the need of the student can take place. It's absolutely unequivocally clear who you're teaching and why when it's one-to-one. -one. When you have to teach a room full of people, you, as one of my teachers put it, you become like a demented waitress running around trying to serve all the tables while worrying you know, with no eyes in the back of your head who you've neglected who's sitting there about to leave and not pay their bill because you haven't been back to their table. Mm. So, yeah, so, um, well, these are a little bit more kind of a little bit off topic, but I'll ask them anyway, um, mm -hmm. if you don't mind staying one more minute just sure. to get through them. So are are there studios or schools that you are aware of that are creating space for dialogue and co-thinking around yoga practice? Yes, I think there are, um, but it's never in as much quantity as uh, asana classes. Um, there's studios that have space on the timetable for meditation, for pranayama, for, for kirtan, for whatever else it might be. So uh, they're not as numerous as the ones that have got a chock full calendar of, you know, how to make shapes, um, but they're out there. Uh, and, you know, you can find them just by Googling like that, uh, you know, discussion forum or, or, or a book club or philosophy um, are the two you know, sort of three keywords I would, I would check out there and see. Um, so they exist. And if they don't at your local studio, I think you could go and ask why not and uh, mm. maybe even start one. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. And we're here, embodiedphilosophy.com. Well, there you go. <laughs> There's also someone, you know, that uh, that's doing some interesting stuff uh, that uh, her name is Nikki Costello. If you look her up, mm. she'll be actually she'll be teaching on uh, yoga on EP as well. So um, those of you who are interested can check that out at some point. And you can also the come last... and chat to me at truthofyoga.com. Exactly. Please. Yes. Truthofyoga.com and danielsimpson.info, right? Correct. Thank you. Okay. I knew I remembered that. So lastly, I like this question. I want to ask it um, because actually I, I, I'm really personally invested in this question, which is, do you know any connection between modern yoga, philo modern philosophy and ancient yoga philosophy? I love this question because actually that's sort of, that's one of my projects that I want to work on at some point because my background is in Western philosophy. And I think there's been not enough work done and lots of really interesting intersections that can happen. And from my research, there isn't much on this, but Daniel, do you know anything? Um, I just, in that yeah, I just sat in on a, a conference the last couple of days in San Francisco, um, where you, know, you might, if you're lucky, uh, be able to, to get access to recordings. Um, it was at, uh, I think, the University of San Francisco and a guy called Jeff Ashton was uh, collating it all. And several mm -hmm. of those presentations were looking at the intersection of um, Sankhya yoga philosophy with Western interpretive traditions around this question of what is consciousness, uh, what is agency as well, um, the nature of free will. Um, I have to be honest that a lot of those presentations were quite dry and inconclusive. Um, 
there's an attempt so to make the traditions speak to each other but they're basically speaking different languages so um, it's yeah. quite a creative game and it can be fun but in the end I felt it said a lot more about our desire to have a connection than it did about the uh, the, the clarity of one mm. yeah that's really good I, I felt I feel that way about around some kind of contemporary philosophers writing on Buddhist philosophy I'm just there just ends up being this really dry distillation of it that wouldn't really inspire me to to take up Buddhist practice, I have to say. <laughs> so, Daniel, this has been such a pleasure, always such a delight to speak with you. Is there anything that you'd like to leave us with and leave the folks at the summit with for today? Well, thank you, Jacob. No, it's a real pleasure to chat. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for creating this space where such conversations can take place and I'd, I'd just like to encourage people to to check out many of the offerings um, I just taught a course uh, last month in March on you know, the evolution of yoga from from the past to the future and um, so if you haven't been part of that course um, that would be a, a great place to dive in to, to get a really you know concise overview of yoga traditions so um, I would suggest that and also this uh, upcoming certificate program uh, will, will that be restarted Starting again there's a, there's a live version perhaps in the yeah I was, thank you daniel you're so good at these um unrequested plugs of our program <laughs> i appreciate it uh, so we are we are relaunching the yoga philosophy certificate program as an evergreen offering um and it's available for a special rate i think it's 297 through sunday and if you sign up for that you'll get access to the upcoming uh upcoming course with um Daniel I'm sorry not Daniel um Edwin on Vedic Vedic philosophy um so if you are interested in learning more with Daniel because Daniel of course contributed to that certificate um and there's a few courses now with Daniel uh podcast interviews that I've done with him for chit heads and then of course please 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 um subscribe patron or whatever other way you can to support Daniel at uh, danielsimpson.info as well as the truth of yoga or truthofyoga.com just truthofyoga.com and on both of those places you'll find a link to my substack where i have my podcast ancient futures so if you're, if you're Ooh, curious ancient I've interest in ancient futures that's an incredibly resonant uh title for what we are talking about here so please go check that out i can't wait to listen myself once again thank you thank you so much daniel Thank you, Jacob.